Son, God, the Holy Spirit. In this meeting, this is the finest meeting this room has had all week. We are here to proclaim the splendor of our risen Savior, our ascended Savior, Jesus Christ, and our soon returning King. Oh, our Aaron in his robe of blue, as heaven stands today, I still got the stars, still got the moon, still got the sun, and Israel is still a nation. And no matter who we are today, how insignificant we are, We've received the finest love letter with a prophetic touch upon it. We needn't wander around to any more avenues because you have revealed to us everything. Everything within our hearts, everything within your heart, Father, everything you showed us in your son, the love and acceptability of coming to Calvary and you revealing to us how this terrible Gentile age is going to finish with leaders having the minds of beasts. In that solemnity, Lord, we thank you for this moment. And we put ourselves right with you again and again. You've revealed that nothing will get better till Jesus Christ puts his blessed, beautiful, pierced feet on the Mount of Olives. And it'll split in half. And life will come into the salt sea. Oh, hallelujah. You've shown us a truth. May we listen to only you this morning, we pray. By the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, you know, that poem, I wrote it out um, on the 11th of December, 11th of October. And I sat up that night and I wrote that um, lovely poem of Amy Carmichael's out. And the next day, Trev came home and said, I need to talk to you. I'm having an affair. And that's truly what I heard the voice of the Lord say. Just lie down. Lie down. And that is all those years ago and the grace of Almighty God. I see people who are just refusing to lie down because you think God is going to bring an articulated truck over you. <laughs> but he's, and that's how we have to get. He's only going to take the life out of you that is injurious to you. The fear, the doubt, the unbelief. He's not going to take his life out of you because he wants to take your life out of you that you might live in the power of his life. But anyone can clearly say, that isn't easy. And together we're going to read these 14 chapters, if that's okay, of Hebrews chapter 5. Now, I won't say anything, let's just get on. For every, now the heading of the chapter is the perfect high priest. Oh glory, hallelujah, Jesus Christ is the perfect high priest. And just the verse above it, which often indicates what's going to happen in the next chapter, says, Let us, Beth Baruch, draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. And then we go on to the next chapter. For every high priest linked with the throne of grace, taken from among men, is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God, in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He, oh, he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself also is beset with weakness. Do you need that today? If you think you're ignorant and misguided, you have a high priest on a throne of grace who says he longs to deal gently. Isn't that beautiful? He, it says he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. That's why the Messiah on Friday we know had to be human. He understands every temptation given to man. And no one takes the, uh, because, uh, and because of it, sorry, verse 3, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins 
as for the people, so also for himself. No one takes the honour to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself, so as to become a high priest. But he who said to him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Just as it says also in another passage, Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up... This is Christ teaching us how to die. In the days of his flesh, imprisoned in the same body that we're in, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying. I want to be there. I want to be with people who know how to cry out for God. I don't want my voice to be the one you always hear and you add your amens to it. I want to hear your voice and I'll add my my amens to that. Seriously, Jesus is our example. Crying out with loud cries, loud prayers. And they think, well, that's a little bit Pentecostal. We are British. This is what Jesus said. When you're earnest, you call out, you call out. Maybe you have to get outside to call out like Martin Luther. Look, supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety, godliness. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Not which blessed him, the things which he suffered. Our suffering will bring us to Christ. What can you learn from sorrow that you cannot learn from joy? Your hardest battles are brought to you the company of Christ as you called out for him. Dear God, I think this time I'm dying. Have you ever said that to the Lord? I can't cope with this. My mind is all over the place. I can't bring it back to you. We cried out. Hallelujah. That's health. That is health in an unhealthy world. Verse 9. Having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Christ is my source of eternal salvation, eternal salvation. And you can put every one of the academics up and they can argue and say, you have lost it. And then you just happen to go through their visa card or you just happen to scrape by when you do their expenses. And you think, right, you believe you could lose it? Maybe you lost yours. You cannot trust man and you cannot trust woman. You can trust this living word. He's chosen to have us forever. Isn't that wonderful? Forever and ever, he will always be our high priest. We will always be his. He will always be ours. Hallelujah. Eternal salvation is something you should look a lot happier about today. Eternal rescuing. Salvation means to rescue, to save, to preserve, to heal, to minister life to. Look what it says. Being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. Concerning him, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Now, I'll be honest. My conversations most day of the week are, mm, I don't understand that. Well, I'm not that far ahead yet. But you want to be there. I want to be there. I remember being saved, reading the word of God every single day and lying there and finding out that after a thousand years, Satan is released. And I remember lifting up my Bible. We just moved into that house and thinking, after a thousand years, Satan is released. Oh, what, lift, what does that mean? I've got to go through this trial of being lost, waiting to be found again. Where do I go? Who can I go to? There wasn't anybody. But then I started again at Genesis and I began to read it and read it. And now I know. And it was just his company in the bedroom or his company in the car. He will show us these mysteries. He longs to reveal his mysteries to us. I don't want to become dull of hearing. I want to know about Melchizedek. Now, I will try and finish this before I move you there. But verse 11, verse 12. Now, this is the verses today. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, didaskalos, teachers 
You have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the word of God, the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. God forgive us, we need milk. Hey? We need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And that is where I think some of us are today. We're drinking milk, and it says clearly, everyone, look what it says here. For those who take only milk are not accustomed to righteousness. Um, about the day you burnt my clutch out, Alec, at the end of the road, I think it's about two years ago, so something like that, maybe three years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lady sat down here who travelled up, and uh, she was overweight, and she says, Julie, I can see that you're a very powerful woman in the word of God. I want you now to pray for me to lose weight. To which I said, I'm, I don't intend to do that. But I will sit down and talk to you. But I can guarantee you, you do not eat God's word. And you do not live according to the law of righteousness, which is why you're overweight. You are actually compensating for something in your life. And I don't think it's as easy as me just praying a prayer. But I will pray for you for wholeness and healing. But you're not, I'm not going to pray and we're going to watch five stones slide out that door because that isn't the way it does. But people are thinking that's a possibility and it isn't. And I said this to her. And this is what she said. I'm fat because my husband cursed me. Milk and ignorance. Milk and ignorance. The curse was broken when Jesus Christ's crimson blood flowed over that robe. The curse was broken. Does anybody have a problem with that? I am not waiting now for a curse to be broken. The curse was broken. The reason I tell you this, this morning, I happened to be looking up something. I was just using my, I got my iPad, but I was, I got my computer up, my iPad up, and I was just looking for something on my phone. She came up on Facebook. I am so unhappy. Will somebody please help me? You see, now this is three years on. My husband cursed me, and I am fat, and I want someone to come and help me. Please don't mention diets. I don't go on them. It's the curse that's a problem. It isn't me. It, it's, it's the curse. And I wanted to say, you poor lady. Oh, God in heaven help you. You poor lady. Three years on, you're still saying exactly the same thing. Then she said, unless you can commit to bear with me, Till this weight has gone, when the curse has been removed, please do not reply to me. So some poor lady has gone on there and said, I can come and help you. And she's put, please inbox me privately. And I thought, I know exactly the conversation you're going to have. But you know, the truth of it is, that is a baby taking milk. But this person's been saved over 20 odd years. And that they're, they're, they're not exercised. Their mind has not been exercised how to discern between the evil and the good. And if we just go back here for a moment, when it, it says here, when it says, um, for everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Do you know what that word means, um, babe? It means ignorant. Everyone who partakes only of milk, I only want the scriptures that tell me that God loves me, is the milk. Not that with the blood about it, that means, blood means sacrifice. Sacrifice means something has to die, something has to be slain. We want the meat that the blood is in. And this is what the Lord says. For everyone, verse 13, who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is ignorant. And then, in the, in the, do you know what else it means? Simple-minded. Simple-minded. Now, God has given me a mind. He's given you a mind. And it has to be renewed every day. But it's a huge brain that God has given to us. And we've only ever used one-tenth of it. The rest we will use for the ages to come. 
but he knows that we have a capacity to learn to take on board information. But more than that, he's speaking to us all the time in the word of God. Well, I don't want to be ignorant, and I don't, so the answer to not being ignorant is to take the meat. So look at verse 14, please. Or the milk is when you're learning, because also that word means um, immature. So when you learn, and Sharon will tell you, when you teach somebody the word of God, you start with the milk and then give them meat like you nurture a baby. Sharon says, I never had the milk with Julie. She just gave me the meat and I've been chewing on it ever since. Yeah. But you see, I think that's probably true, you know, of me. Sorry. Yes, yes. That's what Sharon's saying. The milk wouldn't be enough for her. She needed to be challenged. And let's be honest, folks, we've all got things that, that we're learning or that we're taking part in, and we have to sit down and learn how these things work and do things, and it's no different with the Word of God. So we're saying the milk is easily swallowed. The meat isn't. You have to keep it in your mouth and you chew over it, which is the word meditate, and you have to keep bringing it back. But it is something that's got the blood in it. And if it's the blood of Jesus you're talking about, it also means the death of your own self, that you surrender what you think over to the Lord, really. That's how I see it. If you just go for a moment, please, to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. It's the slaughtered meat. It's the slaughtered meat, Alec, yes. Now, all through the Bible, there are types, shadows, and patterns, and I absolutely love them, and so do you, don't you? Yes. And when you get to Proverbs chapter 8, it's the story of wisdom. And do you remember? It's how Christ was standing with the Lord, and he was playing with him. Do you remember a month ago when we did this? Look at Proverbs 8, verse 30. Because to get to Proverbs 9, I want to know what happened in Proverbs 8. And in Proverbs 8, wisdom was introduced, and wisdom was Jesus. So before a wise woman can build a house, the life of Christ has to be introduced. Yes. He's my householder. He's my husband. He's my lover. I, we have a brother that sticks closer than a lover. Amen. Verse 30. Then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight. Remember when we said dandling over snake pits? He said, and I was daily is, means I was daily his playing. Christ played with the Father. Could you imagine that when we meet Halloween, El Gabor, Almighty God, that he's going to be miserable? He, he'll smile at you and your heart will break. He will smile at you and can you just imagine that smile of complete and utter acceptance of who you are? Can you imagine that? I don't think I've ever received a smile like that other than by faith. When Christ takes us to the Father, he will smile at us with a smile that we will, can you just imagine standing in front of God, Elohim, creator, and him looking at you and loving you. And there's nothing you need to excuse yourself for. We all have a photograph taken and we all immediately look at the worst bit, don't we? You're right, it's true, isn't it? That's the bit I really hate. But actually, by the time you've finished it, I don't think I want my pictures taken. And I actually don't like it. Do you imagine the love of a father because you love his son? I'm smiling at you because you accepted my master workman who laughed with me. Heaven is about laughter. There's that wonderful, wonderful old story. The angels came back and said, there's not enough mirth on the earth. Only the angels came and said, people don't laugh enough. And isn't that true today? You're not laughing being irreverent. You're laughing because he's embraced your heart and smiled at you with total acceptance. I await that smile. I lie in bed and think about the acceptance of God that I'm a sinner, but being accepted and then being led into his glorious kingdom forevermore. And this small brain and this ignorant, milky woman will then learn all the truth forevermore. If we won't learn it, we'll have it revealed to us. And we will go through planets. 
We will be able to know where Venus and all these places are. The whole universe will be where he will play with us. I play in always. Look at that. I was daily his laughing. That's what it means in the Hebrew. I was daily his playing. I was daily his enjoyment. Playing, laughing, rejoicing, how long? Always before him. That's why Isaac, the supernatural born to Abraham, is laughter. He opened heaven and brought laughter into the Jewish home. But the laughter's gone from the Jewish home. That's why they say we're old and grey and withered. And we've received that laughter. And I am challenged. And, and I know people think, you're too emotional, Julie. Yeah, I am. You go off the subject too much. But actually, he is the subject. It's no matter what we're looking at, it's all him, isn't it? Rejoicing, laughing, smiling, always before him. I can do that in the spirit right now, and so can you. Not yawning, vid, turning yourself around. You're not being paid to work, because if you're working, I just think you're a very good worker. You're just being paid to concentrate. And is it hard to concentrate? Always. Well, it, not in Christ. Stand up then, stand up. Stand up if you have to. Do anything to grab hold of this word and say, I refuse to be an ignorant baby that only drinks milk. I can shove a bottle in someone's mouth, but I certainly can't throw Christ to them. That's what it means. I can't show the great sacrifice. I can't throw it yet. I'm laughing in the world, his earth. Remember, this is not Satan's football. This is God's earth. All that this is is not Satan's football. This is the earth um, that he chose to put his son on to bring us to redemption. Having my delight in the sons of men. Who's that? Us. Us who will come. Now, therefore, O sons, listen to me. How, for blessed are they who keep my ways. Heed instruction and be wise. Do not neglect it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my doorpost. For he who finds me in every circumstance finds life and obtains favour from the Lord. But he who sins against me injures himself. All those, I read this a million times, don't you? We read it every month because we're reading the Proverbs every month. All those who hate me love death. Then he sends the invitation. The invitation can go out because he's rejoicing with the Father. He's the wisdom. Wisdom has built her, her house. It's the bride. We've received the wisdom of the one who laughs with the Father. And now I've got to do some construction. I've got to build something on earth. We've got, we've got our house in heaven. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out. She's had to quarry. She's had to go down into the depth of her ugly self and be gone with that and find a virtue of Christ. It says she shall hew, she shall split, she shall construct, she shall quarry, she shall engrave, engrave out her seven pillars, seven spiritual perfection. Is it work? Is it work to build your house for Christ? Yes, because he works, the, he says, I'm working it in, you're working it out. But dig in, dig in to find. She has prepared, that word there, prepared her food, not milk. She has mixed her wine, that's her joy. She has also set her table. This is the banqueting house of the church. But where you've got the word prepared in verse 2, what does it say? She slaughtered her slaughter. She slaughtered her slaughter. She's gone out. She's killed her beasts. Anger, rage, self-pity. I've had to kill some of my beasts. Grief, stubbornness, rebellion, disobedience, ugliness. Kill it. And people think you're being very hard. No, I'm not. If I want a beautiful house, I've got to kill the beasts. And they are horrible. They spit in camels. They're stubborn donkeys. So the donkey gets left when the man goes up on the cross. He leaves his donkey. And when the bride sees the man of laughter, she gets off her spitting camel. Deal with your beasts and go forward. Killing. She has killed her beasts. Do you know what this is in Midrash? 
This sacrifice only points to the great slaughter at Calvary. They know anybody, any rabbi knows that this is the slaughter of the Messiah. This, the principle of the provision in wisdom's house is the death of Jesus Christ. He's got to be slaughtered to build the house. Isn't that marvelous? The death of Christ was prefigured by the slaying of beasts. Isn't that true? When Abraham had to, um, when he told him the future of Israel, he had to bring the oxen, he had to bring the goat, he had to bring the lambs, and they had to be cut into pieces, and he had to pass through. That's no different. This points to Christ. There is death involved in our life. So if there's death for the perfect sacrifice, and Christ's sacrifice has become the feast in my house. The prodigal son comes home and they go and kill the calf. There's a sacrifice for the one who's gone away. It's lovely. So she has also set a table. What does she do? She sends out her maidens and she calls from the tops of the heights of the city, whoever is naive or ignorant or simple-minded, let him turn in here. To him who lacks understanding, she says, come, eat of my food, drink of the wine I have mixed. Wine is joy. The people who are not full of joy are those who will maintain, they refuse to be emptied from vessel to vessel. Let's go back, please, to Hebrews 5, verse 14. I want to live in the house of sacrifice, and I do. You do, don't you? We're slaughtering our slaughter. It's bloody, isn't it? Bloody. Slaughtering your slaughter. You're going to get covered in blood. Don't keep reading the milk. Get where the blood is. Hallelujah. I've been there. We, we want to be there. Right, so what we're going to say here is, um, yeah, but solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, that, that word practice there means habit, have their senses trained to discern good from e evil. Now, when you look at senses there, it means your organ of perception. And, you know, when you look at that, really, um, our mind is a problem, isn't it? Our mind is a problem. When it says here solid food, it's from a wonderful Greek word, and it actually means stiff. <laughs> solid food means stiff, solid, stable. But it's from the root here. Um, which it means to cause, to stand, to confirm, and to place in a balance. And the Lord's, and, and with Daniel, he said, you've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Amen. Well, we will be weighed on the scales and found wanting if we only look at uh, ourselves. We're to look at the word of God. So what we need here is we need solid food. Stiff, solid, and it's, it is from the word, the root word, meaning to be steadfast and to be sure. So if we're having milk, we're not steadfast and we're not sure. Train to discern good and evil. And um, the word good here in verse 14, it means beautiful. Train to discern beautiful, valuable, virtuous, honest, well, meet, worthy, and that's what we're to do. We, I want what is worthy. You want what is worthy. But the word evil is the word K-A-K-O-S. So we'll say it nicely like kakos. But the word um, evil means depraved, injurious, bad, vile, wicked. And it comes from the word to be gluttonous. And you know, this, this is what the Lord is clearly saying to us here. Concentrate on that. That word, good, it comes from the word meaning bright, beautiful, cheerful. And that's what we want. If you just turn a moment, please, to Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah. Now, I think we all know this phrase. We've got to learn the se to separate the precious from the vile. Yes? Got to learn to separate the precious from the vial. But how do we do that? We've just been told. We do it by slaughtering the slaughter. There's got to be a blood exchange. Derek Prince, who a lot of people love very much and love his books, talks about a divine exchange. You've got to give what's lacking in your life and receive what God is abundant in. So if, if, you're, if you've got fear, you've got to 
give your fear to the Lord and let him give you power, love, and a sound mind. And to do that, you've got to be exercised by the word of God, and you've got to learn it, and you've got to believe it. See, I wonder if why the reason some of us don't trust the Lord is because we think he's a liar. You know, we don't believe he's going to be able to rescue us or do what we're asking him. Deep down, is it that? Now, look at verse 19, please. Jeremiah 15, verse 19. Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, then I will restore you. Before me, you will stand. And if you extract the precious from the worthless... You will become my spokesman. But for their part, but for their part may turn to you. But as for you, you must not turn to them. Now that's the word the Lord gave you, Carol, about your working place, isn't it? Yeah? But let's read it in the context that we all know. Look at verse 16. Thy words were found, and I ate them. And thy words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I have been called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the circle of merrymakers, nor did I exult because of thy hand upon me. I sat alone. And I think it says in the AV, because of thy hand. For you, thou didst fill me with indignation. You see, that's what happens. We eat the meat and we know we can't have any part in the things of the world. So we start to sit alone. You don't want to be with the people you used to be with, talking absolute rubbish and garbage. You want to be where the word of the Lord is being proclaimed. Do you know what? This is what I think. Even if you don't want to be where the word of the Lord is being proclaimed, you want to be where it's clean, don't you? That's what I, I want order. And righteousness. I want to practice righteousness. And I do practice righteousness. We do. So you've got a man, Jeremiah, who's a prophet. He ate the word and the word became his joy. Okay? Not only the joy in verse 16. The delight of my heart. But look at the, in, the look what happened after the word became the joy and delight. Look what he actually says. That my delight is I've been called by your name, O Lord of the remnant. See that? That should be enough today for you to be waving your hands, jumping around. Alison said to me on the way, I'm so glad I'm in Sunday school and I'm going to try and speak to these people because they look slightly dead today. That's what Alison said. Well, she, that's what she said. But you know, sometimes it's a natural man, brothers and sisters, isn't it? And you know, here we are. We dragged ourselves in. But really, our hearts have got to be won and engaged. But therefore, 19, thus says the Lord, if you return... He's speaking of Israel. Then I will restore you. Well, we haven't got that. We are with the Lord. If you extract the precious from the worthless, that's the qualification. You will become my spokesman. Yeah. Hallelujah. And then you'll be exercised how to know what's precious and what's vile. Well, actually, it's not that difficult to work out what's precious is it and what's vile. Right. So just come for with me, please to Psalm 139. Now, for the, those who were there yesterday, we've been in the insides of this man for a very long time with the embroidery. But we're also going to go, as well, can you believe this, to Joshua chapter. We're here again, ladies. Verse 18, okay? Now, so if you put your finger in Joshua 18, every word of God is alive and active, yes. And when we look at this verse, we all know it. It's a wonderful uh, psalm. And we looked at the verse from verse 13 to 15. This chapter, if you want to look at the order, has 24 verses. It has six section, four sections of six. So I've got my pen and I've underlined the six sections because they're all talking about a different issue. And I believe if we break it down, we can understand it easier. But David, he looks here at a distant horizon. And he's saying, if I could flee from your spirit, I would go. But he knows that he can't. When you get to the section between 13 and 18, look what it says. For thou didst form my inward parts, thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. A mother's womb is as the depths of the earth, because it's in the dark, cannot be seen, it's hidden. 
and it's secret. But it's not secret to God. Because the word here, as we looked yesterday, is the word, if you're making notes, it's the Hebrew word R-A-Q-A-M. Rakem. R-A-Q-A-M. Your Strong's Concordance is 7551. Okay. And there's another link, actually, when you get there. 7551. Now, this word, embroider, was used to prepare the garment for the high priest who was going to go into the temple. When he formed you in your mother's womb, it uses exactly the same word as the intricate workmanship of the high priest's clothes who had access into the temple. Isn't that wonderful? You were made and embroidered for access into the Father's temple. Your, fight, your tendons, your veins, your ventricles, your arteries, your capillaries, everything about you, the same word is used for the garment that the high priest would present the offering in the temple. That's how important each one of us are to the Lord. But, as we said yesterday, God's embroidery was perfect in Adam. His capillaries were right. His kidneys, his lungs, his blood source was traveling. Then he fell in sin. And a skein of wool, we said, if you, if you just throw something onto the floor, it gets trapped. It gets rubbled up. And God came to earth to unravel his embroidery. The embroidery in you. And the precious embroidery that you were inside of your mother's womb was because he put you there for safety. And he's come from heaven to get hold of his organs and his capillaries and his threads. And he's going to bring a new source of blood through your very being. And he does it by first of us causing us to love him in the spirit. Our spirit is already in heaven, seated with the right hand. Then he ministers to our soul, which is our mind. And then all of a sudden, what do we say about our bodies? I'm becoming, I begin to feel better. Remember, Adam would have been a shaft of light. If they were up on the moon, they would have seen Adam and Eve as two. Every time they moved, there would have been a shaft of magnificent light until they sinned. It didn't happen straight away, but over a period of time, that light went out, not from the body, went out from the spirit, which eventually dimmed the mind, then the light went out from the body. But I think that's a wonderful thought to take you into the new week. And just to confirm, because we are students, let's go to 28, verse 39 of Exodus, please. This, I'd say, is called slaughtering your slaughter. Do you understand? Trying to understand these deep and wonderful things of the Lord. Exodus 28, verse 39, and the heading of this chapter is garments for the priests. I, Julie, was made, and you, Carol Pickard, were put together by God to come into his temple. Isn't that wonderful? But in between you being made... The fall happened and he's now coming. And that's why we've got sicknesses. That's why we've got disease. That's why our minds are all over the place. That's why we sit here and we get tired or the enemy comes and gives us an excuse. He's trying to unravel us. I sense that. Do you? You sometimes sense being in the presence of the Lord. Oh, I'm beginning to feel better because these are holy hands. I'm holy hands, a holy ghost. Look, verse 39. You shall weave the tunic. Now, remember what it said. You weave the baby in the mother's womb. The same words are used. To prepare this one to come into the temple, you shall weave the tunic of checkered work of fine linen, righteousness, shall make a turban of fine linen, you shall make a sash, the work of a weaver. And this is where we need the AV, James. Just read the last line of verse 39, darling, please. Yeah. It says, is it the work of a girdle of needlework? Yeah, so whoever translates this Bible, I've got an objection about it. I don't trust West Cotton Hall. I trust the Textus Receptus. This should read, the work of a girdle of Rakem. 
Needlework, exactly the same word as the baby inside the womb. So if you've got your pens out, I've written mine next to there. I'm a, this, this, uh, the work of a girdle of needlework. And again, it's uh, strong concordance, 7551, cross with 4639. Now, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every matter of established, you now go to 2636. Guess what? Exodus 26, just above verse 31, what's the heading? And again, like we did on Friday night, you're bringing down who the Messiah has to be. Eleven tribes are rejected, but the one tribe, Judah, he has to come from there. There's so many years the Messiah has to come. He has to fit in between 538 BC and 70 AD, otherwise there can't be a Messiah. He couldn't come afterwards, and he came. And now he's saying to you, I want you to know these things and learn these things. I want you to separate today the precious thoughts that are coming to you. Who's having some bad thoughts come to them? I can tell. I can tell. I can tell. Don't worry about me being God's mouthpiece. And I've said it a million times. It can strike me down dead. This is the word. Do you think it's wonderful that the very presentation to come into the temple is the same word that he said about you? When you were unknown to the world in the mother's womb and all the babies, God forbid, that are being aborted today, it's exactly the same word as the garment for a priest. The same workmanship, the needle. Not a machine. And I wrote that after this many years ago. Only the needle has the eye. Knows the reason, questions why. Only his needle. Only his needle. Those intricately woo, those intricate babies that will be aborted will already be in the fullness of this knowledge that we're struggling to deal our flesh, our death to today. But anyway, um, 26, verse 36. This is the veil. Who's the veil? And this is the screen. And guess what was painted on the veil and the screen? The cherubim. And the cherubim are a picture of redeemed mankind. And when the veil in the temple was torn in two, I was torn in two. And when the veil of the temple was torn in two, there was access to see the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, and the blood, the mercy seat. Well, when Jesus died... All the cherubim there are redeemed mankind. And we're seen now and our feet are back in the blood. And on that day, we're going to walk again with the lions. We're going to be back in the garden. So, yes, well done, brother. I love you. You're coming to lunch. Yeah, we have arranged for you. Pardon? Good, good, good. But you're my brother. You're my brother. The veil and the screen, like Alex says, there's a preparation for the Mount of Olives that the seismologists are saying. There's a geological strata fault the mountain is ready to blow. And we go, hallelujah, we're going to be there the day it blows. We're going to be there with him the day it blows. And the third of Israel that, are, that have come with us. And he'll have those bloody red garments on. Just like Joseph had to appear in his beautiful garment before his 11 disintegrated brothers. They'll look upon Christ. And he said, I trod the winepress alone. And his garment will be covered in that battle array. Purple, tarquats, it's the colour of a victorious warrior returning from battle. The battle is not Israel. The battle is against all the Gentile nations. See, I'm standing here and every hair on my body is up. Because I've been chosen to come back with him. You know, like your mother, my mother used to call me the run to the litter and said I was a twin, I was the afterbirth. They were thinking of burying it. This is, that's how my mother always spoke to me. But the truth of it is, there weren't scans in those days, so you didn't know, did you? Get a shovel and bury it. Christ has a purpose for our lives. Amen. And I love what this image means. For a high priest to come in and to serve before me, he needs lots of needlework. We've had it in the womb to serve before him. So now we've got it, the veil and the screen. The screen has been broken in two. The cherubim were on the screen. Verse 36, um, people. And you shall make a screen. The doorway. The doorway. Jesus is the door for the sheep. Enter in by me. If you don't enter in by me, you'll come in no other way. But the doorway of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen... And the work again of a girdle of needlework. Write it again. Rakem. 
That word there is raken, R-A-Q-A-M, raken, girdle of needlework, 75514639. Then go to 2716. 27, 16. Now, just look at this. I mean, you could go on about this all day. This is the outside now of the tabernacle, the court of the tabernacle. But look at the intricacy for the court of the tabernacle. <laughs> Pardon me. And for the gate of the court, there shall be a screen of 20, which is expectation. Something's going to take place. Are we all there, folks? Exodus 27, verse 16. Yeah. Is it worth a hallelujah? hallelujah? That enemy doesn't want you to find these verses and he wants you to be confused. And if you, want, if you think you're clever, the enemy's telling you this doesn't make sense. Oh, yes, it does. Because I'm living in the power of the slaughtered meat. I could be gone under. I could. We could, couldn't we? I tell you, what, I've been feeling so bad since Christmas that I could scream with hysteria. Even standing here is my issue going on. But... I'm just concentrating. I'm, I'm slaughtering some slaughter. I'm dying a death. We'll have to learn how to die just outside the GP surgery. Because you won't get in, Rodney, will you? You won't get in, will you, brother? You won't, will you? I know you're nervous. You won't get in, Rodney. We can tell you. You can't get in. 28 days, you'll die. You can't get in. That's our show. Yeah. You can't get relief, did you say? You can't get in. I know. I know. No. But this is to force us to Christ. I've said it for 20 years, Rodney, but I'm in it now. We're in it now. How many blue lights do you occasionally see? Not many. Like that lady said, there won't be a service for some of us, only those who can afford it. I'm giving my tithes. I've already got some real estate in heaven. I've sent mine up for years. Hallelujah. I'm not stopping. I don't want private insurance. I'm trusting. And if it's one quick blow over the head and she'll be gone, glory. Hey? Exodus 17, verse 6. Unless we talk together like this, unless we recognize this life was to find the Messiah, this life was to find Christ, Recognize why he used his precious needle of Calvary to weave our glorious bodies. And then when he sees us all mashed up, we need more than a bypass. We need the hand of a father to come and correct all the vessels that don't fit like he intended them to. Heart attacks. Luke 21, he says, men's hearts will melt through fear. Melt through fear. It's cool. For the signs that are coming on the age. Now, that's starting, but we're nowhere near in the middle of it yet. Verse 16, and for the gate of the court, I know I'm off, and I? There shall be a screen of expectation, brothers and sisters. 20 is expectation. Blue, purple, scarlet material, <coughs> fine twisted linen. The work of a needleworker. It's rakam. With their four pillars for weak creation. Think of Lazarus in the grave. Christ couldn't be in the grave for three days because the Shekinah over it. Lazarus was in the grave four days. Weak man. For weak man, there's a weaver. For weak man, there's a needlework. Right. With a view to that, we're now going to Joshua. And you're thinking now, how are you going to put those together? Let me show you. Joshua. Joshua 18. I, I, I defy anybody today not to feel the love of Christ when you think of him using the same words to put us together as the garment for the high priest, for the veil, and for the gate. Needlework, needlework, painful needlework. And you know, of course, we do know as well, if you just turn to Psalm 45, keep your finger, because we are coming back to Joshua. We'll go into the land with him, brothers and sisters. You know, we were trying to get in the land such a long time yesterday. But the Lord is good and he's gracious. He doesn't want you to leave. He doesn't want to leave you the way that you are. Because you see, here she is, the bride. Israel have cried out. The bride has come in his garment of death. Bless him. In verse 8. 
Psalm 45, all thy garments are fragrant. It really means all thy garments are death because it, it says all thy garments. It doesn't say fragrant with. It's all thy garments are myrrh, which is death. All the garments of Jesus are death. He slaughtered. He was slaughtered for us. Slaughtered for you and for me. And now that he's been slaughtered out of his place of death, the ivory palace, he's beginning to sh his stringed instruments as a song of heaven. David picked up his psalm. David picked up his harp again in these psalms in the 130. And he picked up his harp to sing of the needlework taken to create a body. And when you come down to verse 40, she will be led to the king in embroidered work. The sheer work that it's taken to prepare you to be led to your saviour king. That is not the word 7551, but you can trace it down through that link. I'm actually giving you the words that you'll go back and say, that is Rakem. That comes from a different word, but it is from the root of that. So I'm telling you categorically that Rakem is the word you're looking for. Where do we find Rakem? Go to Joshua 18, please, verse 27. Joshua 18, verse 27. Can you see it? Rakem is Rakam. Rakem is Rakam. Now, for those of you who don't believe me and think I like sensationalism, <laughs> I do. I got a sensational saviour. I do. And you know, when I looked at this with you ladies yesterday, how on earth can we doubt him? Joshua chapter 18, verse 11, gives out the land to a son called Benjamin. And if you're making notes, Benjamin's son of the right hand. Just above verse 11, it says the territory of Benjamin, son of the right hand. And in the allotment of the son of the right hand, we find exactly the same word as the embroidery. We find it in the land given to the son of the right hand. Well, you, we're told we're seated at the right hand. These blessings are for me. But they've got special names. Now, just as you come under Joshua, if you've got to be a lady to understand this, Joshua chapter 24 finishes with 12 cities. Can you see that? Joshua chapter 18, verse 24. We're in the allotment of the land of the son of the right hand. Would you say it was Christ? You would. Let me show you something. Gibeon starts another list. His name means hill. But it comes from a root word meaning suffering for iniquity. It's a type of the cross. And the old Jewish people and the rabbis see the Messiah here. Gibeon means hill from a root word which may read, Pankhurst says it does, suffering for iniquity. So the son of the right hand has got the land, which is suffering for iniquity that takes you to Ramah, an elevated place. The son lifts us up to heaven. The cross couldn't keep him down. He's resurrected. Argue with this, you can't. It's a list of names, canonized, cannot be changed. Look at the next one. We know this word, beer off. What does it mean? Wells of salvation. Cross of iniquity. We've got a hill associated with suffering for iniquity in the Hebrew. That's what that word means, Gibeah. He then, after the cross, you get an elevated place. Amen. Ramah means elevation. After elevation, you've got a well. Well of salvation. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Is that good? Yeah. Now... Then comes Mizpah. You've got to watch. You've got to be a watchtower over the cross, over the fact that you're elevated. You're going to protect your well. You've got 
watchtower. Then you come to Chepera, which is from the word kafar, which is to cover. We're in verse 26 for those who are struggling. Mizpah is watch power, watchtower. Chepera is to cover. But it's the feminine of a young lion who seeks those who go to the well. I'm still going. It is uh, to cover from the word kafar, C-A-P-H-A. But it's the feminine form of the word for a young lion in a covert waiting to strike at a water hole. Now, this is what I think as I'm lying in bed. I'm still going to the water hole. I'm watching out, but I'm still going. And I'll tell you what happens to some people. They get so frightened of the battle that comes when they go to the water hole. You receive a word and the devil's going to tempt you. You receive a blessing and the enemy's coming. Oh, my car's got a bump. That day I was coming back with Alec. Do you remember, Alec? I dropped you off at work, came back. My bearings had gone the week before, which was about £700, and I haven't got any money. And then my, my husband had arranged for the um, estate agent to come in. I'm travelling back along the road and my tyre bursts. And I've got Pappy Daniel coming. But I've also got the man coming to go around the house that I've tidied up a million times. And I'm thinking, dear God. Do you know, right, so I had to drive the car home on the rim of the wheel. I had to, to get home. And um, I'm not sure if you were there. Alec, Trev comes back to see the man from the estate agents. And he went, Mrs. Edensor. And I said, yes, I'm dreadfully sorry I am Mrs. Edensor, but thankfully not for very long. He, and I walked in because I just about had enough, you know. Anyway, next thing you know, I, t- I got in the pantry, turned around, the man was behind me. I said, no, it's not me, it's him that's selling the house. And he was up there doing his, his normal cheese sandwich at lunchtime and his tin of Heinz tomato soup. But you think, oh, why is these things happening? You know, and I went upstairs and I just, dear God, I've got no money. I've got Pappy. We're the ones who sing. I've funded him for 30 years. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I trod on a tiny little piece of paper, a tiny little card. And it was a psalm, a little inch. And I can't quite think. And I probably, I think it's Psalm 16. But the Lord said, he does. I won't turn you to it. But he simply said this. He does not ignore the cry of the poor. And I threw myself down and I cried my eyes out. Because that man, that piece of paper was an inch. Now, I've been in that bedroom for three years. I know that was God. He does not ignore your cry. Get back to the hole, Julie. The lions come out, but you've got to keep going. The enemy will tell you. Is it worth worth learning all this information just to have a trial and test after you've got it? Yeah, because what we said yesterday, I rejoice in your word as one who's found great spoil, which means I've been in a battle. Now, if we go back here for a moment. Watchtower, because the lions are coming out, because you've got a well of water. And then you go to verse, you go to Mozart. What does that mean? Going forth. Watch me, devil. I'm still going. You've done your utmost to make my testimony as bad as it can possibly be. That man got saved because he said, I've watched you be absolutely ravished, Julie, the last seven years. You know, Dave, I've watched you go completely downhill. Great. But at no time have you ever called out anything horrible about the Lord. So after the lions have come out, Mozar is going forth. That wicked thing wants to come out and get me and roar. Samson was about to go and defeat the lion. He gets to the vineyard and the lion roars at him. Unless you go to the vineyard, the lion won't roar at you. But you're going to go and slaughter some more slaughter. And here we come. Do you find this interesting? Do you find this divine? It's God. This isn't me. This is God. But he is your word then. I'm going for, well, I'll go through it. We'll finish here. We'll go through it. I'm suffering, Gibeon, okay, verse 25, suffering for iniquity on a hill. Could that be the Messiah? To give an elevated place, Ramar, where Deborah lived. At the place of wells, beer off. Out of my belly shall flow river. Come to me. Oh, you are thirsty and I shall give you. Out of my belly. Oh, Father, I want water out of my belly to water somebody. And so do you. That's why you're here. 
But you've got to watch it. Mizpah is watchtower. I'm watching that hill where my Saviour died. I'm watching him. He's lifted me up so I can see him very well, very easily. I've got a well of his water coming out of me and I'm a watchtower. Why? Because Chepera means a lion's just about to come out from the dark. Because you've got something she wants to take from you. You come in the precious, the adulteress seeks the precious life. You see, the lion is a sheep. And it's the adulteress that seeks the precious life. That precious slaughtered life on the cross that has lifted me up. And I'm going to be bothered what somebody thinks about me. I frankly couldn't care less. I couldn't care less. Mozar, after the lions had his say, you still go forth. And then you get to embroidery. Embroidery, that's what it means. To now... I've got to show you something. Gibeon is one. Write the numbers down. Ramar is two. Beeroth is three. Then you've got an and, haven't you? We go on to the next set of three. Mizpah is either four or one. Chepera is two. Is, three, is five or two. Mozar is six or three. But then you come to another set of three. So you've got the father sends the son to elevate and bring the well of water. Then you've got the son, who's your watchtower, guards you from the lions and causes you to go on. Then you come to the work of the Holy Ghost. And the work of the Holy Ghost starts with his embroidery in the secret place. So embroidery. So he's going to come and he's going to try and put... Well, he hasn't trying. But do you ever feel he is trying with me? Do you ever feel the Lord is trying to get me to relax, not to worry, not to be afraid? Do you think that God, the Lord is trying to minister to us? I believe he is. He's trying to do his wonderful work in our lives. He, he's trying to be the work of a weaver for us. He's, he's, he's using his needle, but his needle will hurt us. But it's to make us beautiful so that we can go into the temple. We are going to, we're in it, but we're going in physically. We're going in physically. Okay, for you who are wondering, you get right next door for the embroidery. The broider has come again to repair the embroidery. You next get Herb Peel. His name means he heals. He heals. He heals. Why do you heal embroidery? Unless it's the fabric of a man's being. Glodney is looking at me as a very intelligent man and doctor, as if to say, like being in front of a witch doctor with a juju doll. <laughs> if you don't believe me, because I'm not educated. I know him. <laughs> I know him. What did he say? Yes, you will, darling. Go away and study it, and you'll hate to come back and say, do you know something, Julie? It's right. <laughs> because it is. It is. It is. And, you know, um, I actually wrote the number, if you just turn with me, if you're Rodney, to 3416 in the back of this Bible, and you'll see all the work I'm doing that maybe you don't think I do, and you think I just present. Have a look at this. This is a place called Herb Peel, but why is it next to his embroidery that needs healing? I love that, do you? Yeah? If you like it, Shirley, you are a champion embroiderer, but the Lord says it's time to embroider for him. Every embroidery. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. But you know, like, you have to weigh it. If anyone could look at Shirley's fingers, Sh Sh Shirley's fingers are very badly damaged because of all the embroidery she's done. Yeah. And, but she wears, sorry? She's loved every stitch. But the Lord has loved every stitch of us, brothers and sisters. And for me, I find it quite shocking. We're spending half our life trying to get it fixed. And he's trying to fix us, isn't that? Well, he is fixing us. Three, four, one, six. Can you see it? Uh, peel. 
Y-I-R-P-E-E-L, Rodney. What does he say, brother? What does that make you think? You can trust me. Trust Jesus in me. You see, he can't. But it doesn't matter. Because I love him. I love him. I love him. Right next to the embroidery is a healer. I struggle in life. You struggle. I've only got to go and look at that. Because you see, the next one gets even better. We shall bring you to the fat lady sitting here wanting me to pray for her. Go back to Joshua for a minute. Can you see that? Can you see that, Penny? Penny's not a pushover. Penny has to be convinced. <laughs> I love, well, you what? I'm getting there. I know you are. But I love you, okay? But I know you're not going to... You would not come and listen to me if you thought I was preaching garbage. You wouldn't. You've travelled up from Anglesey to come here because you believe somehow the Lord does speak with us. Mm. Good. Yes. 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 So you know when you got here Friday and we started like a slow coach going up, then Saturday and Sunday's bringing it all together. You understand? But the the embroidery is next to the healer. If you don't remember anything, but the next word name we finish Erpeel is Tarala. Tarala. And Tarala means the verse, the curse, is removed. The curse is removed. Now, go and get your head around that in your study for next year, Rodney. These are the cities in inheritance given to the man, the son of the right hand, Benjamin. This is the allotted land, Joshua said. Why won't you go in and possess what he's given to you? I hate myself. That's what I can say in the natural. You can say it. But today I look again and I think, I was embroidered by you, Father. And when my embroidery has gone up the rock as it has, and things aren't working right, you're standing, you're right in the next city. That's in the physical land. The healer's next to the embroidery. But next to the healer, it is, he's, the curse is reversed. And I want to show you how, Rodney. Go to 8634. Come on, let's go to 8634. We're finishing now. It's getting good, isn't it? Takes a while to warm up. Get through all the... 8634, there's no such word, Julie. There isn't, is there? Is there an 8634? There must be. I've spent hours doing this. Right, Rodney. 8634, brother, are you looking? 8634. You might say, how do you get... Because it sounds too good to... Do you think this sounds too good to be true? Be a woman. Come to the meeting. I'm joking. I'm actually... I have, I've got, we, us ladies have got so many notes on this, and we'll still be doing it in a year, because we're getting into the best bits now. Um, but unless it, we're going to apply it... So we've got the embroiderer next to the one who heals, and then we come... To 8634, what does it say? And I'm saying to you that the Hebrew scholars say the curse is turned away. And what do you get there, Rodney, that indicates that? Reeling. It's reeling. It's turning. But from that, and you can go and study it, you will get there, the curse is turned away. Now, I've got one minute to show you something, one thing. If you go back to Joshua for a moment. Joshua 18. Because he doesn't stop there, my father. The embroiderer is next to the he who heals who to, who, and, the, and removes the curse. Isn't that wonderful news? You then go, he follows on, and he goes to Zella. Do you know what Zella is? It's a rib. A rib, a rib, a rib. It's a bride. It's a woman. She's been embroidered to go into his temple. 
He has healed her and turned the curse away. And she's organically coming in. She's coming in. And the next word, Halef. Halef. You wanted to say something? Sorry, you know the, you know the guy, the way that was in church? Yes. Yeah, more people were going to church. Yeah. Church. Yeah. yeah. Have you read your Bible every day this week? Yeah. I can see. I know. That world wants you, brother, but Jesus wants you more. Amen. I knew it. Salaf for the bride. The rib, the next word. Halef is from Aleph. She comes to her leader. She comes to her ox for strength. This is just a list of a few names. There's 150 in this one chapter. We're working through them all. And then guess where she comes to? Jebusite, which means trodden down. But what does it say in the brackets? Jerusalem! The bride, the rib, the help meet for Adam. She found the Aleph. She's coming under his teaching, under his strength. She's going to arrive. The Jebusite city was overthrown by David, coming into Jerusalem. And it leaves. It gets even better to finish. You see, because it says here, it's got to be made up to four. Can you see it says 14 cities in verse 28? What is 14? Two, the sun, times seven, spiritual perfection. No, not 12 cities now. This is calling out the whole expectation of the perfection of finding the witness, which is God's son, the second Adam. So, sorry. Yes. The bride has found the Aleph. She's been trained. She's coming into Jerusalem. But look at this, and we finish here. This, it says here, after Jerusalem, <laughs> Gibeah, do you know what it is? A hill, a hill. The bride in Jerusalem is now on a hill. And the next word, Kiriath, city. She's in the walled city. She made it because of Christ. Now, I'm just showing you, was it this tiny little section here that you've read a million times there? And that's the whole history of the Messiah gaining his bride. And that is having, we will, we slaughter some slaughter today because you've had to put to death boredom, confusion, Disliking me, wanting, oh, I'll go through it all, wanting your dinner. Pardon? Idleness, slobbiness, yes. But it, tiredness, yes. Yes, but that's not to condemn anybody. But you see how hard it is, brothers and sisters, to gather together like we do. Everything kicks off because this message is so wonderful. Our lives will never be the same after this message. Why does a healer, sit, why is the healer next to the embroidery rod? And I'll ask you that. Your starter, your main course, and your dessert. I'm going to keep coming back to you, and I'm asking you. While you've been worrying about your doctrine, or any of us, it's not important enough, because it'll keep you from slaughtering, because this has got the message, and the message, the message, the message. Now, you haven't got to turn. I'm going to just show you something. I said this to Alec the other day, didn't I, Al? When you get, very quickly, take two minutes, to, the, to the, the, the son, Simeon is the next section. I'm not going to tell you. And his name means hearing with acceptance. So if you write it down there, territory of Simeon is hearing with acceptance. You've got to accept what you've just heard and live in the power of it. He's done everything to get me there. And when I'm in Jerusalem, he's on the hill. I've, I've exalted my son on Zion's holy hill, and we're in the city. The gates are shut. Nothing's coming in for us. But when you get to here, and I just want to show you this little bit. Verse 13. You then, from the territory of Simeon, you come to the dwelling of Zebulun, okay? Zebulun starts at verse 10 of Joshua 18. 
And it talks about a remnant, which is the word sarid in verse 10. And the Lord spoke to me this week and he said, Julie, you will be a remnant of one. Great. You're a remnant of one. We'll be a remnant of one in our homes, our places of work. But be happy to be, it's what it means, remnant of one. But he starts with a remnant. I'm just going to show you this because, yes, everything's great. When you get to verse 13, this is the name Zebulun means to dwell with, to live with. Wished for habitation in my father's house. Before you get to Issachar, which is wages, and he brings wages, there are just three, four names I'm going to show you very quickly. Gath Hefer, in verse 13, means wine press digging. It's never used anywhere else. Wine press digging. Jesus has just landed on the Mount of Olives, and what has he said about the wine press? I trod the wine press alone. This is wine press digging. You then get next to Eth Kazim. Do you know what that means? The occasion for a captain. He's the captain of the Lord's host who stood before they went into Jericho. The wine press brings forth the occasion for a captain. Is that too marvelous for words, Richard? Really? But the next one is Rimon, which is pomegranate. And we finish on the last word, near. So the wine press digging is the occasion for a captain, Eth Kazim, which brings you to the seeds of the pomegranate. We're finished now, Al. Which proceed to the next town. The next town near is the wanderer. The wanderer. The wine press has been trodden by Christ alone, the occasion for a captain. He's brought his seeds in a red fluid, the blood, to touch the wanderer near. Isn't that marvellous? And just to finish, and I know I keep saying this a million times, but it's just so good because if I didn't do this, when you get to 14... There's something marvellous about the north. It means mystery. It says in the borders... Do you see how we were going to work yesterday, ladies? This is what we were doing. But we didn't get there. So we're here today. But you've got to be prepared and ready. I said to Alec, I don't know why I spend these days, hours, because you never get to do it, which is fine. But there is a day, and maybe that day is the day. So we've gone from the wine press digging, the occasion for a captain, a pomegranate is for the wanderer. Thank God there's a seed in Julie that will get to a wanderer. Thank God there's a seed in June to reach the carers. Hallelujah. But look what it gets. The border circles around uh, on the north mystery of Hanathon. Do you know what that means? Obtained by grace. The seeds in me and you to reach the wanderer who's going to be obtained by his grace. He's the man of wine. He's of the tribe of Judah, the wine tribe. Hallelujah. And to finish, look at this. Is this God, Richard? It ended at the valley of If to Hell, which is where it is called. But because it's the north, it's about a mystery. And we finish with this. It will be opened by God. Amen. It will be opened by God. The mystery of the north will be opened for those who have obtained grace. It will be opened by God. Isn't that marvelous? Amen. Father, we've just taken some of your word and we've slaughtered. The reason we've had to slaughter our slaughter is the mind, the will, and the emotions get in the way of the most.